today's session is that Tom is going to be giving you guys a talk about cows and methane. <laughs> yeah. That was a very basic um, <laughs> introduction, but I feel as though you're probably more of an expert and will be able to introduce it much better than me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yes, uh, it's, it's certainly it's about cows. Uh, cows is my home territory. Uh, data science is what I'm learning. So I'm hoping the collective knowledge of this group can give me some pointers as to what to do with with R. All right, let's just share my screen. Um, right, now that's come up, is it? Yes. Oh, it was slicker than yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> So much. Multi no multilingual video, right, for those who are there. <laughs> OK, so yeah, my name's Tom Chamberlain. I'm a master's student at Harper's, uh, doing it part time and remote, uh, uh, doing a data science master's. Uh, so I'm in my second year now uh, and I've elected to do it mostly by research. So this is one of the projects uh, or topics I'm looking at. Um, uh, over the, over the past couple of months. Uh, the, my email address is there. What I'm hoping to get out of this meeting is ideas from yourselves as to how to analyze this data, uh, what to do with it and so forth. Uh, I appreciate my you know, my analysis methods may be fairly basic uh, and I'm sure there's better things. Uh, if you have any ideas, if you can just type them in the chat, um, then hopefully I can skim them up at the end. So, what we're wanting to look at is uh, enteric methane production uh, from the dairy herd in the United Kingdom uh, and seeing what we can do with farm data. Uh, my commercial work is looking at a lot of farm data uh, and I run a service of analysing milk recording data uh, for the feed industry. <clears throat> the results here are from about half of the potential full data set. Uh, it's about 150, cow, 150 herds. Uh, that we analyze routinely. Uh, and so the data I'm using is sort of across my desk as part of my routine work. So at the moment, we're about 37,000 cows in the data set, uh, 150 herds to say. That probably can get up to about 400 herds. Um, so percentage wise, it's not a very big part of the national herd, uh, but it's a decent chunk of data. No, why won't it? Why won't we go on? That's it. OK, so uh, for those who aren't familiar with methane uh, and I'm very much on the learning curve with methane as with R really. Um, but methane, it's a greenhouse gas. Uh, it's more powerful than carbon dioxide, anywhere between 26, 25 times more powerful or up to 86 times more powerful, depending which conversion factors you use. So at Glasgow COP meeting, uh, there was a pledge to reduce um, methane production by 30% by the year 2030. When they said that back in 21, they thought that was miles away. Um, it's you know not that far, really. And it's probably starting to limit what technologies we can use to deliver. Uh, things that are still in startups, uh, programs, um, probably aren't going to come through in time. So that's a diagram on the right from uh, CL, uh, who just across the road at Harper's, of uh, carbon footprint for a high yielding dairy herd. And yet half of the production is from methane, carbon footprint is from methane. And I forget which conversion factor they use, but it might be even more over a different time scale. Uh, and by far the biggest is enteric methane. And a little bit of modeling work the CL have done gives the indication it's probably the, the one that's got the most potential for modification on farm. OK, so what can be done uh, for mitigating uh, methane production? We're in an era of innovation is the buzzword uh, and you've got to have something that you can put in a bag or put on a floppy disk to sell. Uh, so a lot of the initiatives are uh, in products that can be produced. Uh, one is leading the market, this Bovia one, um, but there's a couple of others as well. Bovia is probably the furthest ahead in terms of being available on the international market. Uh, if you speak to Kate Robinson down at the dairy, she's saying, oh, it's going to cost between one and two pence per litre 
uh, to to feed this additive. Um, and her big question is, who's going to pay? Uh, it's the classic um, uh, private cost, public benefit. Uh, and that's, you know, the supermarkets are beginning to square that out, but they'll get there in the end. The other curious thing is that on the one hand, we've got people running around saying we've got to reduce the use of antibiotics because of antimicrobial resistance. And then you've got these folks running around saying, oh, we want to feed an antimicrobial into the rumen uh, to modify the rumen environment. Uh, so there might be some uh, hiccups and hurdles on the way getting through that. <clears throat> others are about um, seaweeds available and a few others. And they're probably the leaders in terms of reduction. Uh, Bovir can, says they can get up to about 30% reduction. Geneticists say they can make some gains, but they're looking at quite a long time horizon before that would get into the national herd. There's all sorts of other weird and wonderfuls out there. Um, there's boluses that will time the release of drugs. I've come up with some very weird devices, uh, hats and things that people you know, think you can put on a cow. Um, I'm not sure whether I'll get to market or not. Um, and with all these things, they're new. So there's a risk that we're going to see unforeseen problems. Uh, and if you look back through what's been launched in the past 10 years, there have been some very peculiar reasons why drugs have been or products have been withdrawn, which couldn't have been foreseen, really. OK, so <clears throat> if we can improve efficiency, um, <clears throat> now the simplest way is we're going to dilute, dilute the amount of methane produced per litre of milk. Uh, and the aim of this project was to see whether how big that was likely to be uh, and was it in the same ballpark as the figures on the previous slide. So uh, we're looking at lifetime production. So that's from well, it's from eight weeks until the animal leaves the farm uh, as a cull cow. Uh, and we're expressing lifetime methane production divided by lifetime milk yield. And what I want to do is to look at the variation between national herds if we can see what the range is and we can see where a specific farm is, then the further they are from the top quartile, I would argue the better their chances of making an improvement. So it gives them some idea of how likely they are to make an improvement and what effect it's going to have. We know how to improve the efficiency on dairy herds. There are some very, very efficient herds out there. Um, so uptake should be fairly quick. Um, the only barriers are social barriers persuading things to do to do the, to do the right thing uh, and work with the right people to make the improvements. The other advantage of improving efficiency rather than feeding a magic powder is that you know, improving efficiency should increase the farmer's gross margin uh, and therefore that should transfer into profit. Um, so hopefully you can reduce methane output and increase profitability rather than just incurring a cost. OK, so what data am I using? <clears throat> data source I'm using is commonly recorded to milk, referred to as milk recording data. Uh, there's three companies in the country that do it, private companies. The main ones, NMR, which Harper Adams use on the two dairies. CIS uh, tend to use, do a lot of the uh, herds in the north. And there's a smaller one which we don't quite use. Um, the advantages of this data source is that the data and milk samples and everything are collected by the companies involved, by someone they employ, so they're impartial uh, and you get good quality data. Um, I think we saw a little bit in the, uh, the PRISM project, uh, farmers tend to give answers that they think you want as well as answers that are the truth. It's a pretty well curated data set um, in, by NMR and CIS. Uh, and they took a very early opinion that it was the farmer's data. So anyone the farmer wants to have access to the data can have it. And behind it all, particularly for the core data, there are some international standards. Um, it was mentioned yesterday uh, in the hackathon as well. But as a Scandinavian company or organisation called ICAR, they make sure everyone does the same. So it's a high quality data set. It's pretty complete. Um, there are a few holes in it which you can check for, uh, and it's very easy to get hold of. Um, I can just download them as I want. There's some bias in there in that the farms I work with tend to be farmers who want to work with their feed uh, 
companies to improve performance and so forth. So they're probably slightly better than normal farms, I would guess. So the full data set is probably 350, 400 hertz, uh, and we'll work up to that. But at the moment, uh, we've got about half the data in, and that's what I'm presenting today. So to look at it, picked up on an idea that um, AHDB played with um, across all sectors and have dropped to some extent. Uh, I'm not sure what discipline it's in, but it's overall equipment effectiveness. Um, so uh, and it's, it comes out of manufacturing factories uh, and it as a measure of how efficient the machines are. So on the left hand side is the original version. So if you're thinking about a machine that makes widgets, it takes time and resources and capital to build the machine. When it's up and running, you need to look at the level of production. What's the quality of the product that's coming out there and how much defective product you get that you have to throw away. Then are there service intervals and then how long does it run for? Uh, and there's quite a large body of science on the knowledge there that says you can use that information to look at the overall efficiency uh, and work out where you can make improvements. Right hand side <coughs> is my attempt to transfer that into uh, dairy cow uh, speak. So time to build the machine is age to first calving. We've then got uh, a lactation, a variable length with a variable milk yield. Um, and we know what's in the milk, we know the quality. Um, we don't know discarded that well. We don't actually model it in this, uh, in this work. The dairy cow has a service interval. She has some downtime, the dry period between lactations. And then there'll be a variable number of lactations uh, before the animal is culled. So that's going to define her lifespan. So the data we've got, the main data we use, are the dates of the births, deaths, carvings, drying off events, along that with the milk yield. Uh, and the, the graphic down the bottom is trying to put that into OE style. Uh, we've got uh, aged first calving or the rearing phase, about th so these are six month chunks here. So it's two years to carve down. First lactation, she milks for 328 days and she gives 10,600 liters and then she's dry and so on. Uh, and that's the actual data from uh, the, the main, the future farm at Harper Adams. OK, we've also got information about when the animals are culled uh, so we can start picking out what's the culling rate at different like at different ages. Um, and I suspect that culling in the early lactations is going to be very important. You spend all that time and resources raising an animal for two years for it only to give one lactation and then she's culled. Uh, that can't be very efficient in, in any way that you tend to you care to measure it. So <clears throat> what we're interested in is the gold sections. These are the good bits where we're actually productive. And then it's really how much her time uh, does she feed, spend in, in the other areas being non-productive. So from that, we can work out what the cow is doing every day of her life. You know, big brother is watching sort of thing. Um, and if we know what she's doing every day of her life, uh, we can start, yeah, we've sort of covered that, yeah. If we know what she's doing every day of her life, we can start to work out what methane is produced. So those are the five parameters, the main driving parameters in the model and derive a lot of other parameters from that. Um, and those five parameters in my other models, I'm tending to call that the vanilla set. Um, they're the ones I first thought of, sorry. Right, so how does the model work? The domain it covers is from weaning at about eight weeks of age. Methane production pre-weaning and pre-rumen development is pretty inconsequential, so we've ignored that. And you know, post leaving the farm, uh, which will be uh, going on to slaughter generally, methane production in that stage is pretty minimal. So really trying to capture as much of the cow's life cycle as we can. So we're working at the whole lifetime. Assuming over the lifespan of an animal that if we take into account uh, body weight gain, the animals grow and get bigger, energy requirements are the same as energy required. 
you know, it can't really go anywhere else. Uh, we can use a wide range of models to work out how much energy she requires each day. I've chosen um, a British one from AFRC in 1990. It's one of the few that covers all production stages. Um, some don't. It's still fairly simple that you can have a factorial approach. You can say, what do I need for maintenance, weight gain, pregnancy, milk production, so forth. And from that, <clears throat> reasonably simply, you can calculate how much energy that cow requires every day. Uh, and if you look in the literature, uh, there are equations um, for predicting methane production. Uh, that's probably the best one I can find at the moment. That methane production is related to energy intake. Not a brilliant degree of fit, uh, but it's what we've got. OK, so the results. Um, <clears throat> And so these are a preliminary, um, really trying to explore what's in the data and what we, what I can do with it. Um, on the software, I, I, the code I built in R, uh, we can pick out one herd. So I've dropped in uh, the Harper Adams herd there so we can see where they are. So how we got typical data, herd size averages out at about 250. It's probably bigger than a lot of sources, but it probably does represent uh, the bulk that is representative of the commercial herds um, who are producing the bulk of the milk, I guess. Uh, I've got one or two extremes. Um, there's a couple north of here, even the biggest herd I've come across is 1,300 cows. Um, but really, this is the main bulk of it, and that's the, the, the population of herds that we really have got to influence. Age at first calving. The target is 24 months. Um, here's Harper Adams. Uh, Kate's just about on that, 24 months. But it's one of the targets that the industry tends to miss um, by a few months. Uh, and that's probably similar for the next data. Uh, carving interval, textbook interval is sort of 360, 370 days. Most herds are, are a month or so higher than that. So there's probably scope to improve efficiency. Um, and some herds can do it, and it's not related to production level or anything. Uh, it's just you know, getting on and doing it. Culling rates, um, you get one or two very high figures, probably driven either by tuberculosis control in the southwest of England, uh, or possibly retirement, changing herd sizes and things. So I've tended to prune the very high culling rates out um, because I don't think they're typical of a commercial farm. And at the same time, I've culled out herds with very high butterfats because they're probably Channel Island little Jersey cows, uh, and they don't really fit the assumptions, the background assumptions in my model. Um, so that was the last one there. Average lactation when leaves the herd. Uh, that's probably uh, uh, Future Farm's biggest limitation, possibly due to the research work that's built in there. But you can see the average is about three, three and a half lactations. Uh, so not that long, certainly not compared to the suckler industry. So if I start modelling the methane um, emissions uh, using the model that I've uh, proposed there, this is the range. This is lifetime, this is methane production per kilogram of fat and protein corrected milk over an entire lifetime. Uh, so it's not quite the same figure as is commonly quoted in the literature, so the numbers might be a little bit different. Um, the interquartile range goes from about there down to about there. That's a 13% reduction. Uh, and you know, it's pos it should be possible, I would argue, that anyone who is at the, on the, in the lower quartile, on, on the bottom interquart of the interquartile range, you know, should be able to, with better management, uh, better planning and so forth, to get up to the top quartile. So there sh it should be a 13% reduction that most far the poor performing farms can achieve. If we want to go for a big number to put in the press, then the range between the upper decile and the lower decile is a 23% reduction. So compare that to the figures uh, that these uh, feed additive companies are claiming. It's probably in the same ballpark. Um, and because this is improving the efficiency, it's not actually altering cows' rumen function or anything. They're probably synergistic. 
Uh, it might even be straightforward additive. Um, so yes, you could imagine that a poor performing herd improving their performance and having a feed additive it could get to a 50% reduction. All right, so what I'm wanting to do is to be able to deliver this back to the farmer um, so they can see what improvements they can make uh, and they can see whether it's worth doing. I want to be able to incorporate it back into uh, the commercial model that I send out to farmers uh, and that's based on a spreadsheet because everyone can open a spreadsheet. So I need to get have a, a reasonably simple model um, to put back into the feedback towards the farmers. Um, so some of the fancier things, uh, I scratch my head as to how I'm going to apply them. I haven't worked it out for random forests. So baseline uh, is a single a simple regression. Uh, these are data from a single run. I have done some validation. Um, and the baseline root mean square error is about 0.03. Uh, so that's the benchmark. That's the thing to beat. If you look at the, the data, or just look at the R squared for simplicity, you know, milk yield, milk production dominates, um, which is, is logical. Um, the more milk a cow produces, the more she dilutes out all the requirements for maintenance, for growth, uh, for heifer requirements, um, and even for pregnancy. They're all constant, uh, so it's getting diluted out. Um, but it would be quite nice to be able to see whether and it's a question to the group that is it valid to look at the residuals once you take milk yield out and say what other things can you do? Because altering milk yield has far more uh, repercussions uh, than changing calving interval, uh, age at first calving and so forth, because there's dietary changes that has all sorts of knock on effects. Any questions, just shout out. As we go along, well, I don't think there's anyone there. OK, so yeah, I validated the test model, um, ran uh, six iterations because uh, it was there's a random process in, sl in splitting the data. Uh, it deteriorates by about 5%. I thought that wasn't bad. Um, uh, uh, so uh, that model looks to be reasonably robust. Uh, there's no, can't seem to be there's any evidence of overfitting. All right. Then I started looking at other things. Uh, Ed presented a session a while ago on random forests, uh, on the, the prism data. Um, I suspect they're very different in structure, these two data sets, which might explain why the results are slightly different. Um, looked at what, uh, six different models there. Uh, the first one I call the kitchen sink is I had 25 variables uh, that sort of might have related to methane production, so I threw them all in. Uh, and then started taking out some of the milk yield variables and eventually I took them all out. And then I reverted back to being a biologist uh, and said, let's you know, just put in the model, the variables that I think are going to work um, from my reading uh, and from previous experience. So you go from extreme data scientist to extreme biologist, I suppose. All right, so looking at random forests uh, and uh, putting up these things about the relative importance of the different factors. This was the kitchen sink variant, and you can see that yield is really dominant all the way through. Yeah, these are just different ways of expressing milk yield. Uh, probably that was that all the first seven of all milk yield, and then a few other things start to come in after that. Uh, if I prune it down a bit, um, so I, there's not so much repetition or highly related variables, um, you still get milk yield is very dominant. Uh, and it would be nice to be able to look at what, what else you can do other than just get the cows to milk harder. Uh, because there's pushback from various sectors of just saying, you know, get the hack, more milk, more milk, more milk. It's more strain on the cows. And it's probably not what the public want. OK, so summarising um, the various the six random forests I looked at, um, those six things there, when I took out all milk yield variables, um, the percentage of the variance uh, explained just collapsed. 
Um, but up until the vanilla set, they were all fairly useful up at 90%. And if you look at the root mean squared, at the error uh, coming from these various predictions, that's the benchmark. So yeah, my best set uh, and the bigger models worked better. Uh, but just simple linear regression actually comes up fairly much in the middle of the results from various random forests. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I think I've, uh, I've covered that. Um, I've been doing some, uh, some validation uh, just with a 50-50 split and repeating it. Uh, and then also looking at uh, best subsets. Not throwing up so far any models are a lot better um, than my initial vanilla uh, linear regression model. But then if it's got an, uh, an R squared of sort of 90 something percent, are we, is it fair to expect that we're going to get better models uh, by using different techniques? So yeah, best subsets, sorry there's too much text on there, but doing forwards and backwards generally tend to come up with very similar models. Um, again, milk yield driven um, and cross validation, they seem to hold up fairly well. Um, and that was 11% reduction uh, in performance. Um, not big, only four or five variables being called for um, before uh, the gain in R squared starts to plateau out. Right, there's the last slide, there's a lot on here. So, okay, my thoughts on what to do in the future, and I'd, I'd love some opinions from other people as what to do, uh, particularly if you can drop them in the chat. Um, obviously, expanded out to the full database. Um, whilst doing this preliminary work, I have refined my variables a little bit. Uh, so I need to go back and, and run uh, the model on you know, the herds I've done already and on the whole set. Um, yeah, what other regressions can we, uh, regression type models can we use? Uh, answers on the postcard, please. Other things that are in my uh, commercial model is that can start to put costs. I know there's economists in the meet in the room, so I said they're working at the gross margin level ish. Uh, it's a little bit vague, um, but we can start to say, yeah, if you reduce your age at first calving by X days, it's going to benefit you by Y pounds. Uh, and we can apply, we can come up with numbers, or well, I can anyway, I can come up, I can invent numbers for all four of those major parameters. And milk yields fairly easy, it's the value of the milk probably, or the gross margin value of the milk. So we can start to say, right, if you make this improvement in your farm, you reduce your culling rate by X percent, then your gross margins are going to go up by this amount and your methane production is going to fall by that amount. So it's going to be an easier one to, to work with the industry on, I think, because it's starting to look like a win-win. Uh, it's pro uh, profit positive. And it's also a line that the supermarkets, who are the main people who set the uh, the mood in the dairy sector, uh, the supermarkets have been pushing farmers to work to is to become more efficient. So what I'm hoping is that you know, we can come up with a thing to say, if you improve your, this KPI, but this amount, your KPI for your carbon footprint will fall by that and your gross margin will increase by that. That's been done a lot over the years, and some farmers are starting to see a lot of these tools as, as farmer bashing. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, pressure there. You can also do this looking at uh, the cow level uh, rather than just the herd level. Uh, we've got the data at the cow level. Uh, we can apply standard equation, equations at the cow level, similar to what was done in the PRISM project. And I'm starting to see that the variation is much bigger at the cow level and the herd level. Obviously, uh, you're not getting things averaged out. And probably we're starting to get seeing the variation, similar variation as uh, it was being reported in the PRISM project. Then it gets interesting because you can say, well, does this relate to genomic test results? A large proportion of national herd now is genomically tested. So that data is all on file. Uh, so can we start to select for cows that for some reason or other 
have got a low uh, carbon footprint output or methane output. Um, and yeah, that would be considerable interest to the industry. So can we start uh, talking about whether uh, there's a consortium type project there that the industry might be interested in? So that I think, yes, is me all done. All right, thank you, Megan. Questions, please. Um, I have a bit of a basic question, and it might just be that I actually missed um, when you said it in the presentation, but what were your sort of dependent variables that you were looking at? I don't well, know. So probably ought to go back and share. So sort of dependent, the Y. Yeah. Yeah, the Y is just methane output. OK, and is that something that you calculated using that calculation? Yes, yeah. Yeah. OK. So yes, cool. it's, it's a modelled, the independent variable is a modelled variable rather than a, an actual measurement. But to measure carbon output per, uh, methane output per cow, you can do six cows at a time on about five sites in the United Kingdom. OK. Cool. So what other methodologies should I be experimenting with? Um, I think Joe put something in the chat that I don't understand, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Milking yield variables that you started checking out. So Joe, you've gone quiet on us again. Am I back? Just about. All right. Uh, that's why I prefer typing because I have a really bad mic. Um, <laughs> I was saying yeah. the milk yield variables that you have, I saw that you've started experimenting with taking some of them out. Uh, was it because they were correlated to each other? I... I'm sure they are. I haven't formally explored that. Um, I did try and do a correlation of everything against everything, uh, and yeah. you just get a smudgy mess in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Um, so, yeah, I need to explore that more. Um, but um, okay. my understanding from Random Forest is that it didn't matter, and it was probably almost an advantage to have correlated variables in there. Yes, but it matters in your linear model. Yes, yeah, it, so... yes. Yeah, so yeah. also uh, uh, it matters if you want to um, squeeze out variable importance. Uh, random forests will rank them regardless whether they are correlated or not. But if yes. they also explain each other, I have a bit of a concern there that, that they might one might mask the importance of another. So that's why I suggested those other two bridge regression and lasso regression are basically regressions that shrink your variables your, your coefficients based on how important they are so oh, for yes, example, yeah. if you do a ridge regression you might have 20 variables in your model it will bring you back only the five that matter everything else will disappear and it will bring you the relative importance of those five if you do a lasso regression, uh, it will give you all 20, but it will give you very small coefficients according to how important that variable is. So it gives right. you the same sort of variable importance ranking that random forests will do. But uh, for the ridge regression, it's it's a little bit more convenient because it will actually act, chuck out some, just take take them out entirely until you don't even include this one. So I thought the milk yield ones would end up eliminating each other and you would remain with the maybe the, the two that are really important that should yeah. be in your model. Yeah. Yes, I mean, that's, I suppose, what I was doing uh, in an informal way with my pruning of the of the models I was putting up to the random forest. 
All right. Okay. It's, uh, I, I just thought it's yeah. Well, no, that's great. I, I will have. I, I I've met those. I haven't uh, processed this data through uh, either Ridge or Lasso, uh, mainly because I was, I wasn't. I could never see how to apply the results. But I think you're saying, get the model structure from Lasso and Ridge, and then take it back to a more simple regression model. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I would I would try that and at least compare compare the variable importance that it brings up, yeah. especially the ridge one, with what uh, random forests were telling you. All right. Yeah. So great. Thank you. All right. So unfortunately, Carl's had to leave, but it'd be nice. Uh, you're, are you familiar enough with the prism work or Eric to see how it compares? Not so much. We had done some initial estimations to um, to see whether we would use regression models or we would do um, um what is it? We wanted to look at uh, Um, we wanted to look at structural equation modeling. So we initially did some initial regression to compare, but um, later we decided to um, we decided to stop because we had wanted to get a PhD student on it to get additional data in order for us to look at the structural equation modeling, but the application field. So I think for now, we've decided to do um, data envelopment analysis. So we've not actually explored this data set to a higher level that would allow us to actually make significant input. Right, yeah, okay. So there's quite a large data set there. So any other ideas what we could do with it? Maybe we should have our own hackathon on just on this data set because this data set's in English. The one we yeah. were showing yesterday was has a lot of Italian in it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's quite complex with um you saying that there are different variables that could affect the yield outcomes. So if you were to change something, it would potentially have um repercussions on the yield which would then affect the methane and like yeah, trying to balance that. it's only modeling part of what happens on farm uh, methane production is a bit more complicated than this um mm. but yeah there is the problem that the, the, the instinctive reaction is how do i reduce my methane output per litre of milk is just push the cows very very hard uh, and everything the supermarkets learn from the general public is that's not what the general public really want. Uh, they still want to I think they're in the 1960s with cows frolicking around the fields. Um, you know, and some of them have actually said cows must go out or have the ability to go out and look pretty. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Sorry, I haven't got my headphones on. Um, Can you hear me, Alicia? Hello. Uh, I just wondered, so the, you said that this is something that you would look into adding on to your spreadsheet that you send to farmers. Um, but would it be like an optional extra or would you just be putting it straight in to your spreadsheet? Um... For simplicity, we just probably put it straight in. It doesn't go directly to the farmers. It tends to go to their advisors, uh, mostly okay. the feed industry. Um, but it would be giving farmers numbers um, you know, where you know, they can use to compare themselves. Um, mm. And you know, playing around with whether we can do any sort of what if analysis. Um, you know, we've, we've got a decent regression equation. You could start doing well, what if analysis saying, you know, if we make this improvement on the farm, what will it do to our gross margins? What will it do to our, our methane production? Mm. 
and therefore our carbon footprint. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think um, that would be really interesting for both the advisors and the farmer to understand because maybe it might help their relationship as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's there seems always seems to be like a gap in um, knowledge with uh, like how how a farmer could improve and then how the advisor wants the farmer to improve. So, yeah, it, I think your tool could definitely help the industry with with bridging that gap. Yeah, um, there's, you know, we can work out uh, with all these models and things. What's the potential gain? Um, yeah, then working with an individual farmer, uh, you then got to work out, you know, can you do it? How can you do it? Uh, mm. And it almost comes down to who's going to drive what tractor at what time and where the cows are going to be here, there and, and then. Um, and have we got enough water troughs? Um, so, yeah, it needs to get it to actually happen on farm. You have to have, be able to work it all the way down to how do we practically implement it? Mm. Uh, and some farmers will say, I just don't want to do it. Uh, that doesn't suit my way of life. Um, but all we can do as advisors is supply objective information. They can build that in in what they're going to do. Uh, mm. If they're 60 with no one following on, with no succession, they're probably not interested in fancy new ideas or longer hours. Yeah. yeah. But new generations coming in are. I think it was um, quite interesting what was being said about the structural equation models, um, just in terms of thinking about the flow of how different management things or changes that farmers could make or might make would have an impact on their yield, which would then have an impact on the estimated methane production. And I guess being able to see or try and figure out what would be having direct impacts on methane production versus potentially indirect impacts on that methane production. But I'm not fully across whether you'd be able to use that um, in like what a- What are we meaning by direct effect? <laughs> um, so like- one, one definition would be, I'm just going to stop the cow producing uh, so much methane with a fixed input. Mm -hmm. which I suppose is where the feed additives work. Uh, yeah. They, they modify, modify the function of the rumen so it just produces less methane in any given mm -hmm. situation. Um, yeah. Whereas what I'm looking at is sort of, the, yeah, probably the other end, it's the indirect of saying, yeah, we're not going to tamper with the rumen. Um, it's a challenging thing to do. Um, but if we run the system as efficiently as we can, will that reduce methane production? Mm. So, so do they complement each other? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. I mean, I'm trying to think it in, through in my head. But... Because if you know that it's from your, like, um, random forests, that it's the yield that's having the biggest impact on methane output then you're almost interested in what you could do oh wait no never mind i don't think that makes sense yeah I, yeah the yield has a big effect and that's mainly because yeah. it's, di it's diluting it out so half the nutrients that the cow takes don't result in any production during her lifetime so the more milk you produce, the more litres or kilograms of milk you've got to spread all that non-productive methane production across. Yeah. And there are there are other advantages that you actually change the rumen fermentation slightly uh, mm -hmm. and that's less favourable or you get less me me methane produced uh, per kilogram of milk. Yeah. But there is <coughs> so uh, there is a reasonably strong uh, pressure um, not to increase milk yields 
Um, it's the super, supermarkets who tend to be the arbiters of public opinion uh, in this country, in the dairy sector. Uh, they're reluctant to be seen to be saying, uh, make your cows produce more milk. Mm -hmm. um, because they, they don't think that's going to be the sort of thing the public want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking in terms of like the variables that you previously mentioned, like the lactation length um, or the length of the dry period, whether they would have effects on methane production that weren't necessarily directly related to the yield effects that it has. Well, they will. Yes, they, those sorts of things will. Yes. Mm. Um, four of the five things in my vanilla set will be working independently of uh, a feed level. If you have a very long dry period, then the cow mm -hmm. spends more of her time not producing milk as an adult animal, and therefore there's more time and more energy consumption that's not and methane production that's not related to milk output. Okay. <sighs> Because I feel like what you're sort of indicating is that whilst yield is a big impact in um, methane production, you're not necessarily wanting to change the yield itself as like an outcome. You want the yield to be staying at pretty much the same level, like you're not wanting to push it too high. You, yeah, but you there's, also there's don't resistance, want to yeah. lose so our, that. Our so advantage you're, of, doing, of looking at the residuals. Mm doing a similar regression of yield against methane production and then saying the mm. residuals contain all the variability that's not related to milk yield. Yeah. <laughs> they, do, they do it a little bit uh, when they're looking at feed intake in cattle, uh, mm -hmm. a term called residual feed intake, which is saying how does it differ from the standard model uh, and the best cows will have an, a high residual intake they're eating more than we're predicting. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, we've lost Joe, sadly. Yes. There we go, because I should have picked his brain on that one. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if anybody else has any possible contribution or ideas. Uh, have you come across looking uh, modeling residuals? Was Claire gone home for tea? I think everyone's going home for tea. I think we probably ought to stop. Quite possibly. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't give you any R um, input. I'm still quite the novice with it as well. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, I can't help you on that matter. Well, I, I, I was picking on Claire because I think she's fairly slick on R. If her computer's working again. <laughs> Sorry, I've been literally joining halfway through because I was at the lab earlier and it's a bit so I've been following but we're only with an ear uh doing lab stuff so oh, I'm, right. not I'm not entirely sure uh I can help much um but yeah okay did you get my specific question no sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's all right now, yeah we've got one dominant variable in the regression models if we take that yeah. out and it's not correlated to everything else is it then fair to look at the residuals and say what's what are the remaining variables uh, are driving changes in those residuals? Well, I have no idea. I'm not that good at art. Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> no, I wish I was, but <laughs> yes, I wish I was too. It's a horrible learning curve. No, I feel like mm. I learned that stuff once, and then the day after, I've already forgotten. It's the kind of stuff I need to learn again all the time. So. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> no, and I don't. I don't think you can Google it. You must ask Joe or Eric or someone or Ed. Yeah, or Eric's 
We lost mm. I feel like a structural equation model could be a good way to go in terms of looking at the more indirect effects. So what's a structural equation model? Uh, um, <laughs> a great question. How do I describe that? Um, or can you point me to something to read to learn more about it? I mean, I think. Can I uh, Google? It? Yes, go. <laughs> so I've, I've I've used. So I had. I hope it makes sense to you, Tom. I've done some regression yes, analysis and I've used um, partial correlation. And this is where I took out some variable, especially the ones that were more of pre that, that have a higher predictive power to analyze and determine whether the remaining variables were somehow co what the effect was once I took out that strong variable and their relationship to the dependent variable. So I did partial correlation, I'm sure. I don't know whether that, that's something that can help you. That and sounds roughly like what I want to do, yeah. Yeah, and then the structural equation modeling, I'm currently also trying to use that because I've used multiple reg uh, regression to predict or to understand factors that influence the dependent variable. But the problem with a multiple regression analysis is that it's linear. The, the, the correlation is linear. Yeah. So structural equation modeling allows you to understand how the correlation between the variables among between and among the variables influence the dependent variables. So if you have three variables, are they fast related to each other, then at the end influence the dependent variable, or is just that or do the three just individually affect the dependent variable? So if if you're drawing arrows, it would be arrow A, let's say the dependent variable is A and you have independent variables B, C, D. So the first thing you would draw would be a multiple one regression would just be all the three arrows for B, C, D uh, pointing towards A, which is the dependent variable. But a structural equation model would allow you to either draw an arrow from B to C, then to A, to trying to understand that relationship, or B to D, then back to A, or just simply B to D because there's no relationship when you do an individual sort of analysis for that. So I'm also trying to use that to do a bit of um, a regression analysis. It's a much more it's a much more better way to see, especially if you have more variables, to see how they influence each other and their impact on the dependent variable. I'm not sure. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. What package are you using for that? So for the structural equation modeling, wait, for the multiple regression modeling SPSS, as you would, but then for structural equation modeling AMOS, which is a, subs, a subset of SPSS, so you'd have to sort of purchase it on its own to conduct the SEM analysis. So at the moment, HAPA doesn't pay for the AMOS for that, so we, have, we are contracting someone else to run the, the, the structural equation modeling, but with a multiple regression or partial correlation, you can conduct them on SPSS. All right. Mm -hmm. Or stata. I'm not sure whether you know of stata. It's uh, just stata, stata, I call it stata. It's, it's very much related to R because you can write the codes directly or rely on, on codes already written to run the analysis themselves. You right, can also you. run structural equation models in R as well. Um, I'm not, I can't pluck the package out of my head right now. Um, I know that there's piecewise structural equation models that's often used in sort of ecology where you have smaller data sets, but that's potentially not a problem um, for you with this dairy data. Um, but I can't remember off the top of my head what the package is called, but I can probably figure it out and send it to you. If you could pop that over, that'd be brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was great from my point of view. Um, Made me get my head together on ideas together a bit, and it's given me various avenues to carry on pursuing. So, yeah, thank you all very much. Has the clock struck yet? Can't hear it from here. Oh, not quite, I don't think. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, not far off. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you for giving us a talk today and keeping us entertained. Um, hopefully, you got something from the session. Um, yes, I have. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully there'll be some progress and maybe at some point in the future you can update us on how it goes. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a topic Eric and I are looking at. So yeah, hopefully we will, uh, what between his child, his expected baby and things, we'll find time to carry on looking at it uh, and, and work yeah. with the full data set. Yeah. Nice. So sh shall I send, is today Ed's last day? Um, I'm or not... Himself? entirely sure i think it might be yes right. so if i'm going to send this presentation